Either you're Lord or you're not. That was one of my favorite lines in the new faith-based movie called The Fords. But we are gonna get into some things from a licensed therapist perspective starting right now. Hey, hey, everybody, if you are new to my channel, welcome. But if you're a returning subscriber, you already know how my review videos go. Full disclaimer, there will be spoilers in here. So if you have not watched The Forge, press pause, go on over, watch it, and then come back so we can chat about it in the comment section. So put in the comment section, what did you think about The Forge? What did you think about the message, the inspiration? What did you get from it? I love the fact that this was a Christ-centered movie. I had the opportunity to attend a VIP advanced screening at Sony Pictures here in Los Angeles, California. So I seen this maybe a month or so before the movie came out, but nobody told me to review this thing. This is not a paid promotion. I am doing this review because I really thought that it was a powerful movie that everybody needs to see, believers and non-believers. Y'all already know I'm Team Jesus, so let's get into the first thing. The first thing that I want to talk to you guys about in regards to The Forge is anger issues. If we didn't see anything else, we've seen Isaiah have a huge anger problem. And as I mentioned before on my channel, anger is what we call a secondary emotion. A secondary emotion means you are not really feeling what you feel in just because you feel it. You know, nobody's ever really angry just for the sake of being angry. You're angry because you're disappointed. You're angry because you're sad. You're angry because you're lonely. You're angry because you've been rejected. There's always something deeper underneath the anger that we have to get to the root cause of. And once we get to the root of that thing, then we can start dealing and managing the actual anger with some really powerful techniques to help you mitigate that strong emotion. And if I'm being honest with you, I think that Isaiah's anger was coming from the fact that he was rejected and abandoned by his father. Let's be real, he was walking around mad at the world. He had an attitude with his mama. He had an attitude with strangers at the coffee shop. He had an attitude while he was trying to fill out a job application. He just walked around mean mugging people and just seemed very unhappy and angry and very easily upset at the small thing that other people may do or say to him. And it got him nowhere. I'm talking about Isaiah needed to go to therapy. Isaiah needed anger management. He needed to go to therapy. His mama needed to go to therapy and they needed to go to therapy together for family as well. So they needed some individual and family therapy in order to mitigate this situation. We know we are team Jesus and therapy on this channel. The second thing that I want to talk to you guys about is the mother-son relationship between Isaiah and his mother. Their relationship was rocky. Woo, Isaiah wasn't in school. He wasn't helping around the house. He was playing video games all day. He didn't have a job. He didn't want to pay rent. Him and his mama were button heads a lot of the time. His dad wasn't present and so the brunt of all of the responsibilities was on his mom. And I don't know about you guys, but I came from a single parent home as well and I'm sure many of you have too. So we understand how important mamas are. We understand how important it is to just really pour back into that mom because trying to hold it down when you're not getting either financial, emotional, or any other type of support can be very difficult, especially when you are raising a son because you only can teach them so much. I can teach a girl how to be a woman, but I can't teach a man how to be a man. And so she went the tough love route. She said, look, you ain't gonna be living up in here, not paying rent, not going to school. Even if you don't wanna go to school, that's fine, but you're gonna get a job and you're gonna pay me some rent. We know that he did, but there's nothing more powerful than a praying mom. That was the best thing that she did for Isaiah was to pray for him, not make him get a job, not make him clean up, not make him do any of the things, but being in that prayer closet, <laughs> being on her knees, not giving up when all hope is lost and she didn't know what to do, that is a powerful thing that any mother should implement. Pray for your baby. That leads me to the third thing that we saw in The Forge, which is a spiritual community. I know we are in this day and age where we feel like we don't need to go to church. People are not going to church as often. You know, people are not gathering and, you know, having that support, that spiritual support. And so I understand why a lot of people are flocking and leaving the church house, but I also understand the power of community. I also understand the power of being surrounded by other people who are going to hold you spiritually accountable. We go to other people to hold us accountable for our finances, for working out, for eating clean, for doing all of these different things in our life. 
But what about your spirituality? What about your connection with God? I know for me, being a part of my church community and having someone who's for real holding me spiritually accountable has been a game changer. Somebody checking in, hey, Keandra, have you been in your word? Hey, Keandra, are, are you praying? <laughs> hey, did you fast? Like you said, that you, okay, well, what did you hear God say? What is he telling you? What is that direction? What's that? Boop, boop, boop. Those are some of the most crucial relationships that I have currently in my life. And I wouldn't give that up for the world. Shout out to Ignite. I firmly believe that you need people in your life who you're going to be able to do life with. Somebody that can pray for you, that can pray with you, and that can pray over you. Because sometimes you're not able to do things on your own and you need somebody that is going to intercede and be able to stand in the gap for you when you're not strong enough to do it for yourself. And I love how Isaiah's mom knew in to call in spiritual reinforcement. She knew, okay, he acted and cutting the fool. <laughs> Let me go ahead and call my homegirls and we gonna meet at the salon, we gonna meet at the shop and guess what we gonna do? We gonna pray, we gonna pray for each other, we gonna pray for him, and we are going to storm heaven with our requests. And them prayers got through quickly. When grandma came on the scene, <laughs> when she, listen, when she walked into the salon for the first time, and I was watching this video at the advanced screening with everybody, everybody was like, woo! Because we knew her from War Room. And we know that she don't play when it comes to Jesus, okay? So it was really great to see her pull up and understand that, there are some people that can get a prayer through to heaven and that thing can turn around very quickly. And we've seen that happen. We've seen them praying at the salon and then she came home and Isaiah talking about, I was, I was praying and you know, I asked Jesus into my heart and, and she was like, you know what we was doing at the salon? <laughs> we was praying, but we was praying for you, you know, and we we're praying for these very things. So it was like, God moved swiftly and quickly. By the time she got from the salon to her house, God was already doing a huge work in his heart. The fact that the salon was included in this movie was powerful to me. And we know in the black community that hair salons, we call them the shop in the hood. <laughs> and barber shops are really crucial for the black community. Somebody said it like this, that salons and barber shops were the first therapy session. Beauticians and barbers were like the first therapists because you would come in, get your hair cut, get your hair washed, get it, you know, whatever services you're trying to get, but you talk. Okay, we talk about our lives, we chat it up, we talk about our issues and our problems, and while they're not licensed professionals, it does feel like a relief and a safe place when you can come and share your stuff and know that other people are going to support you and that your business is not gonna be in the street. The fourth thing that we have to talk about is discipleship. There were two things that I felt was really huge throughout this movie. That was discipleship and forgiveness, which we'll talk about next. But when we talk about disciples and discipleship, we're not talking about the 12 disciples in the Bible. We're talking about you and I being disciples of Christ. We're talking about living, thinking, breathing Jesus. We're talking about being a living example of what Christ should be like here on the earth. We are the hands and the feet of Jesus. So being a disciple is who you and I are supposed to be. And that isn't just for the church house, that isn't just for the people who already believe, but it's being those examples, those living examples in areas where there are unbelievers, on your work, in public, when you're out, when you're at the park, where you're at the grocery store, can they feel that something is different about you? Do they know something's up with this girl? I can't pinpoint it, but she is oozing the fruits of the spirit. And this is when we have to go out and help those that are lost and that are confused and that who need that extra help. And we're not condemning them to hell and we're not saying, oh, you suck, you know, but we're trying to be that example of what Christ should be like on the earth. And I think unfortunately that's where the church has failed because we love to condemn, we love to point the finger, we love to do all of those things and we don't do the best job at loving people first. Some people <laughs> are not coming to Christ just because they are going to be condemned to hell. People come to Christ because of the love, because of the support that he died on the cross for our sins. And so if he is doing all of those things for me, why can't I extend that same love, grace, mercy, forgiveness, 
to other people. That's what we should be doing. So in regards to discipleship, we see Mr. Moore really take in Isaiah. And it started kind of like as a mentorship thing, come in, come in early before work. I gave you this job. Let's see what's up. And then that slowly trickled over to discipleship, right? And that slowly trickled over to God being a part of the conversations and him just living right before Isaiah and allowing him to see how this thing is supposed to be done. Mr. Moore wasn't perfect, but he lived and strived to to be an example of Jesus here on earth. He walked with him. Mr. Moore walked with Isaiah through the good, the bad, the in-between, everything that was going on in his life, whether he thought he was making good choices or bad choices, he was there to support Isaiah. And it was life-changing for him. I mean, literally life-changing. Isaiah changed his whole life. He got connected with another group of men called The Forge, which is the name of the movie. He started going back to school. He had a better relationship with his mom. He started paying rent. He let go of his idols and wasn't playing video games anymore. He started to rebuild that relate or build and rebuild the relationship that he had with Jesus. He was doing all of the right things, but he had someone who was guiding him and holding his hand and who was helping him on this journey, even when they were very clear setbacks and when he could have made other choices, he knew he had someone who he can go to to get advice, to get prayer, to get scriptures, to get equipped and built up. So he had all of the tools that he needed to be a better individual, but also a better follower of Christ. And what I love was that he was no longer being a drain, but he was being a fountain. If you watch the movie, you know what I'm talking about. But this led him to forgiving his father, which we're going to talk about in number five when we talk about forgiveness. I've seen two big displays of forgiveness in the Ford. The first display of forgiveness I saw was Mr. Moore forgiving the very man that killed his son in a drunk driving accident. I'm still getting misty eye even right now thinking about that. To be able to forgive the very person that took your son away from you at what, I think he was like 16 or, you know, very young, he was a minor. And for that individual to be a part of the forge and to be discipled by him and really embrace him was beautiful. That shows the ultimate love of God. That shows the ultimate form of forgiveness. And it shows that if God can forgive us for our sins, all of the raggedy things that we have done, all of the ratchet things, all of the wretched things that we have done, why can't we extend that same grace, that same forgiveness to other people, no matter what they have done too? Now, I'm not saying you got to bring that person back into the fold and have a very close relationship with them, but I am saying that forgiveness is truly for you. It's just like that saying goes, you know, forgiveness is drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Like it just doesn't, it doesn't work that way. We expect other people to forgive us, so why can't we forgive others? And I'm sure that took tons of healing and tons of deliverance. And I think we all can agree that he was right. He could have been mad. He could have stayed mad at the drunk driver and said, nah, you killed my son. That's a wrap. He had full reason to stay mad, to stay bitter, and to stay upset. Nobody would have faulted him for that, but he chose to be like Christ. And that was a beautiful message. The second display of huge forgiveness that I saw was with Isaiah and his father. There was a scene where Isaiah was working, he was doing his thing, doing well at work, and his dad was a delivery driver. Woo, they locked eyes and Isaiah lost it. He ran off and you know had a whole crying moment, but it really went back to the thing that we were talking about in the first one, that, that anger, billowed up on the inside of him because he felt that rejection and that abandonment from his dad. And it was kind of like, why am I going to forgive him when he left me? He left our mom. He left us in this very horrible predicament. He doesn't deserve to be forgiven. But this is what happens when you are truly in discipleship. This is what happened when Jesus starts to change and transform your heart. The things that you used to feel and think about certain people, they get altered and changed and rearranged. And you start to see things from a different perspective. And so we saw Isaiah make a faith declaration and say, yo, I don't know how to do this. <laughs> 
I don't even know if he deserves forgiveness, but I am going to choose in my heart to forgive him because I am doing what you have told me to do, God. That's what it says in your word to do. He made that faith declaration. You know, he forgave his dad. He let go of the anger and he allowed God to transform him. And that spiritual transformation led him to doing something in the natural, which was writing his dad a letter and actually sending the letter to his job in hopes that he would read it and respond. And guess what? He did. He got that text saying, hey son, I've been longing for this moment. I got your letter. When can we connect? And while they didn't show what happens next, that is probably going to be the rebuilding of that father-son relationship that he longed for. And think about it, when Isaiah, you know, gets old enough and he was, you know, he was flirting and he was with the other girl that worked at the, the uh, coffee shop, right? So he might date her, they might get married, I don't know. But when he gets into a place where he becomes a father, he's gonna be breaking that generational curse, right? Of absentee fathers in his bloodline. So repairing that relationship is going to help him have a relationship, a good relationship with his son, hopefully. And then that can trickle on over from generations to come. Generational cycles and curses are a real thing. So we need to make sure that we are breaking them. If you are a generational curse breaker or curse shifter in your family. My final thoughts on this is that this movie was a 9.5 out of 10. Y'all know I rarely give 10 out of 10, but this is probably one of the closest things to a 10 that I have given a movie. Y'all one, because it was Christ centered. Two, it had a beautiful message. I walked out of there feeling inspired, feeling motivated to change and just desire desiring to want to get closer with Christ. And I think this movie is going to not only impact believers, but it's also going to impact non-believers too. This isn't just a whole little Jesus rah, 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 but if you have people in your life who are unbelievers, who are struggling, who are agnostic, who are on the fence, who are atheists, who just need to know that Jesus loves them, this is the movie to share with them. I am a little biased <laughs> about faith-based movies and I always laugh at my mom because she loves watching faith-based movies, but all of them are so bootleg, right? Like they are so like low budget, and it looked like somebody filmed it on their phone, right? And I'm just like, it's hard to get into. The message is always beautiful, but it's hard to watch because a lot of these faith-based movies don't get the funding as bigger um, worldly <laughs> movies get the opportunity to get. And so I hope that we desire to pour more into faith-based content and that our stuff in the realm of the spirit and Christianity is equivalent to the things of the world. And I'm saying as far as presentation, because that is important to real people in, right? If I'm a believer and I don't want to watch Christian movies sometimes because it looks real low budget and bootleg, think about the unbelievers who wouldn't want to watch it for that reason. So I am praying that God gives more opportunity and resources to the Kendrick brothers, to Affirm Films, to all of the people that were a part of this project, to Sony, who really put effort into this thing. And I hope that we see more of War Rooms and The Forge and Overcomer and movies like this that are going to change people's lives. When we were at the screening afterwards, they wind up feeding us and they had like a live Q&A with some of the cast that was there. And what I loved most was that not only was the Kendrick brothers and the cast, but they talked about how everybody on set was believers. They talked about how they prayed. They talked about how they had other people stand in the gap and intercede. They talked about the process of even writing this movie and allowing the Holy Spirit to move on set. I loved hearing all of those conversations because that isn't something that you see every day. So the fact that the people in front of the camera and behind the camera were believers, were Christ-centered, was dope. All I gotta say is if you haven't seen it, go see it. If you already seen it, go see it again. I went twice because I took my mom and my sister. <laughs> but I just wanted to end with thanking you so much for watching a review video on my channel. Make sure to stick around, like, comment, subscribe, stay connected, watch some of my other reviews on movies and TV shows, and I will see you next time. Be blessed. Bye.